Hey, welcome back everyone. So where did we leave off? Oh yes, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a huge box office hit, so New Line Cinema quickly started production on a sequel. And the following year, we got Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze. And sadly, this one took a few steps backward. One of the major complaints they got from the first movie was that it was too violent for children. And that complaint seems kinda silly in hindsight, especially by today's standards. The worst thing you can say is there was a tiny amount of blood. Hardly seems worth the pearl clutching. Nevertheless, it seems the filmmakers took these complaints to heart. There are still plenty of fight scenes in The Secret of the Ooze, but they have been greatly toned down and are a lot more cartoonish. The turtles hardly even use their weapons this time around. They still have them, but they don't use them. And that just seems flat out weird. Each turtle is supposed to have their own signature weapon. That's been a staple of the franchise since day one. Leo has the katana, Raph the Psy, Mikey the Nunchaku, and Donnie the Bow. They just don't look right without them. Even in the undeniably kid-friendly cartoons, they still use their freaking weapons. And the lengths they go to have the turtles not use their weapons are downright ridiculous. In the opening fight scene, not only do they use toys like yo-yos and whatever the hell that is, but Mikey actually fights off a would-be robber with sausage. Honest to God, sausage. And next time I'll use mustard! Mustard? Dear God, Mikey, what's next? Sauerkraut? When will the senseless violence end? And if that's not ridiculous enough for you, there's a scene where the turtles find themselves caught in a net, and Leonardo never thinks to use his katanas to cut himself and his brothers free. I guess cutting a net was just too violent for the kitties. Anyway, most of the original cast returned for the sequel, but there were some notable exceptions. Corey Feldman was out as the voice of Donatello as he was in rehab at the time. Casey Jones was played this time around by Sir not appearing in this film because, surprise, surprise, parents thought he was too violent. And perhaps the most surprising recast was Paige Turco as April O'Neil, replacing Judith Hogue. Hogue did not leave the franchise willingly, by the way. She wanted to come back for the sequel, but simply wasn't invited. And according to Hogue, it's likely because she had several complaints about the first movie. She wasn't a fan of the level of violence, which, you know, join the club. But she also had concerns about the six-day-a-week shooting schedule, director Steve Barron getting fired during post-production, and the mistreatment of the stunt doubles. Hogue claims they brought in a bunch of non-union guys from Hong Kong, and onset injuries were pretty frequent. And when a guy got injured, they simply shipped his broken ass back home and replaced him. That is kind of messed up. I guess these complaints made her difficult to work with, and April was recast. But for once, difficult to work with is not code for refuse to sleep with a producer, so I guess that's an upside? Secret of the Ooze also introduced a new character, a young man named Kino, played by Ernie Reyes Jr., who was actually one of the stunt doubles for Donatello in the first movie. Apparently, they liked him so much, they made a character for him in the sequel. Let's have a look. Which one of you lucky girls gets a ride with me tonight? Dream on, dweeb. Ooh, swing and a miss. But I'm sure he'll accept this rejection with dignity and grace. Yeah, okay. But when I do, I'll dream of something a little thinner. <laughs> or he'll act like a complete douchebag. He is supposed to be one of the good guys, right? Kino delivers pizzas for a living because, of course he does, but one fateful night he takes a detour to try to break up a robbery. Despite his martial arts skills, he soon finds himself in a world of shit. But fortunately, our heroes in a half shell just happen to show up and save the day. And then they take his pizza. But they did pay for it, so I guess they're technically not thieves? Whoa, Mikey, watch how you're holding that pizza! The toppings are gonna slide right off! Actually, this is another really weird thing about these movies, and indeed the franchise in general. The Turtles always seem to have money to pay for pizza and various other things. How do they get it? They don't appear to have jobs, and I imagine the hiring market for large anthropomorphic turtles is remarkably small. And they're the good guys, so obviously they're not out robbing banks or anything. So where does the money come from? Well, I did some research into this, and it turns out the answer is shut up, Sean, it's a movie. Anyway, despite being a bit of a jerk, Kino ends up befriending April and the Turtles. Congratulations, kid. You're the new Casey. Now grab yourself a hockey mask and a cricket bat. As for the villains, the Foot Clan is pretty much in shambles after the events of the last movie, and Tatsu is now the de facto leader. <laughs> Clearly, he's taking it well. I, Tatsu, now lead. Whoa, what the hell happened to his voice? I swear he did not sound that dorky in the first movie. 
When I heard this, I thought for sure he must have a new voice actor. But no, it's still Michael McConaughey, same guy as the first movie. So what changed here? I know Tatsu's voice was always campy, as it should be, but I swear it has a much higher pitch now. Ninja vanish! It's kinda hard to buy him as a legitimate threat when he sounds like a Japanese Bobcat Goldthwait. It also doesn't help that, apart from murdering that table, he doesn't actually do anything in this movie. He's always there, but that's it. He's just there. At least in the first movie, he got to beat up Casey Jones a bit. Anyway, Tatsu isn't the leader of the Foot Clan for long, as the Shredder is still alive. Somehow. His face. My god, he's been recast too! And Shredder makes it clear that he has only one goal in mind. Revenge. And after revenge... Plastic surgery. My face is pretty messed up. Now, if Eastman and Laird had their way, Shredder would not have come back for this film. Instead, they would have introduced a new villain, possibly Baxter Stockman, and saved Shredder's return for a possible third film. But the producers wanted the movie to be more like the cartoon, which meant Shredder had to be the bad guy. And we wouldn't get Stockman on the big screen until 2016's Out of the Shadows, where he was played by Tyler freaking Perry, of all people. How did that happen? Well, moving on. Caught in the middle of all these ninja shenanigans is David Warner as Professor Jordan Perry, who works for a company called TGRI that accidentally developed the ooze that made Splinter and the Turtles what they are today. It's also really good fertilizer. TGRI is frantically trying to cover up, uh, I mean, safely dispose of the ooze for perfectly ethical reasons. Yes, that is definitely what they are doing. And this brings both the Turtles and the Foot Clan knocking on their door, the former looking for answers and the latter looking to build their own mutant army. And the filmmakers' original plans here probably would have been a lot of fun. Reportedly, they were going to do something similar to the comics, in which the Ooze and those who created it were extraterrestrial in nature. This would have been the titular Secret of the Ooze, and the story would have involved the Utrams and the Triceratons. Sadly, those plans were scrapped, which means the actual Secret of the Ooze is, whoopsie doodle, we mixed the wrong chemicals together and sinned against nature. It's hard to not be disappointed by that. This is also why they changed the name of the company from the comics to TGRI, Techno Global Research Industries, instead of TCRI, Techno Cosmic Research Institute, which hinted at the ooze's alien origins. Although the ooze may not be alien, it is dangerous in the wrong hands, like Shredder's, and he uses it to create his own mutants to fight the turtles. I remember being pretty psyched about this as a kid, as I had heard rumors that Bebop and Rocksteady, Shredder's henchmen from the cartoon, were going to be in the movie. And indeed, the producers wanted Bebop and Rocksteady, but Eastman and Laird were very much against it, and this time they got their way. So instead, we got a snapping turtle and a wolf, known respectively as Toka and Razar. He's just trying to force you guys into fighting Toka and Razar again. Oh, excuse me. Toka and Razar. Toka! Razar! Well, which is it? Razor or Razar? What do I keep saying about continuity? As for why the Turtles creators were so dead set against having Bebop and Rocksteady in the movie, Laird clarified this in a blog post a few years ago. It's not so much that I disliked the characters so intensely, but more that I found their constant one-note shtick in the first animated series to be extremely annoying and silly to the point of being stupid. That was, unfortunately, a constant aspect of that whole series. Mind-numbingly dopey repetition. Well, Mr. Laird, allow me to say, as a die-hard fan of that series, you're not wrong. Anyway, Shredder initially considers Toka and Razar to be a failed experiment as they are mutated baby animals and thus far inferior to the Turtles in terms of intelligence. But they are ridiculously strong, so he keeps them around. And to lure the Turtles into fighting them, he has them basically destroy a city block with the promise of more destruction to come. Although I imagine the mayhem they caused isn't too different from a typical Saturday night in New York City. In the final battle, the Turtles managed to trick Toka and Razar into eating an anti-mutagen Professor Perry and Donatello cooked up, which ultimately renders them harmless. And during that fight, the movie goes completely off the rails. They somehow stumble into a vanilla ice concert, and instead of everyone completely freaking the f*** out, they keep on dancing as Ice makes up a rap about the Turtles right then and there and allegedly Ice improvising what came to be known as Ninja Rap on the spot is not much of a stretch. Mr. Van Winkle claims he wrote that song in a hotel room in about half an hour. And honestly, I believe him.
Let's be honest, does this big-lipped alligator moment feel like anyone involved spent more than 30 minutes thinking about it? Don't get me wrong, I love this scene. The chanting of Go Ninja, Go Ninja, Go is incredibly catchy and the entire spectacle is stupidly awesome. But it is also awesomely stupid. Well, as a last resort, Shredder drinks what's left of the ooze and turns into future pro wrestling champion Kevin Nash. I'm not kidding, that is actually Big Daddy Cool under there. Or since it was 1991, Oz. Somehow Super Shredder was less bizarre than his World Championship wrestling character. Wrestling is weird. I'm not sure why the mutagen also mutated Shredder's costume, but I don't care. Super Shredder looks fantastic. You know what's not fantastic? The turtle's not having to fight him because he stupidly kills himself in about a minute. That's really the climax of the movie. Shredder hulks up, screams a lot, and then dies. The only thing more rushed than that final showdown was the production itself. Apparently, the studio was convinced TMNT was a fad that would fade quickly, so they made that sequel in record time in order to strike while the iron was still hot. 30 years later, that iron still hasn't cooled. And the lesson here, boys and girls, is studio executives are stupid. Overall, I do think Secret of the Ooze is still a fun movie. The Turtles are still the same characters we all know and love. They retained much of the first movie's sense of humor, including Donnie's inability to come up with cool catchphrases. Acapella! Huh? Huh? They also moved out of the sewers and found a new home in an abandoned subway station, which does look pretty cool. And while I was hoping to see Bebop and Rocksteady on the big screen, I thought Toka and Razar were perfectly fine. And the tribute to Jim Henson, who had recently passed away, was a nice touch. But the movie is still far inferior to the original. Some of the jokes do not land, like when the turtles are trapped in the net and acknowledge how well made it is, and Mikey says, Remind me to drop a line to Ralph Nader! <laughs> no one in this movie's target audience is gonna get that. That? And how the hell does Mikey know who Ralph Nader is? As for Kino, it was cool to see Reyes show off his martial arts skills without a 70-pound suit weighing him down, but I wasn't a huge fan of the character. And there's a lot of shit in this movie that really doesn't make sense. For example, there's a scene where Kino and Raph attempt to infiltrate the Foot Clan's headquarters by having Kino audition to become a member. Yeah, a secret ninja clan is having auditions, but that's not the weirdest thing. As part of the audition, he has to pull a bunch of bells off a dummy without making a sound. And luckily for him, they have him take the test in concealment, which basically allows Raph to sneak in and do it for him. But why did they want him to take the test in concealment? I, I, I don't get it. What was the point? And then there's the scene where Shredder first meets Toka and Razar, and he is legitimately surprised to learn their babies. How is he surprised by that? Did he not see the animals before they mutated them? Did Tatsu and the foot soldiers just dump the wolf and turtle in the cage and Shredder just walked up there with a big canister of mutagen and was like, well, I don't know what's in there, but it's gonna be fun finding out. Doo -dee -doo -dee -doo. I almost have to wonder if Tatsu was punking him here. Maybe he was genuinely upset that he didn't get to lead the Foot Clan and this was his way of getting back at Shredder. And these are the two most vicious animals you can find. <gasps> Good. Oh my god, he has no idea! This is going to be hilarious! Speaking of Shredder, I have issues with that new helmet. I like the serrated blades on top, but the scales on the sides look terrible. It looks like the helmet is made out of post-it notes. Wasn't the sequel supposed to have a higher budget? Clearly none of that money went into the helmets. And the fight scenes were just not as good this time around, and not just because the turtles rarely use their weapons. You'll note the foot soldiers take very few shots at the turtles, and reportedly there was a practical reason for this. The turtles' costumes gave the actors very limited visibility, which meant the stuntmen couldn't rush in and attack them since they'd have no time to react. So basically they spent most of their time standing around waiting to get hit. And I'm sure the rushed production didn't make the choreographer's job any easier. In the end, it's kind of a disappointing follow-up, but it does have its moments. Ten-year-old Sean liked it, for whatever that's worth. Unfortunately, the suckward trend was only going to continue with the final live-action installment before the reboot. The first reboot. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. Oh lord, where do I even begin with this one? Well, let's start with the turtles themselves. Notice anything different? That was rhetorical, of course you do. When I first saw this, I assumed the budget had been drastically slashed for the third movie, but I found conflicting information online. Box Office Mojo says $21 million, which would be slightly below Secret of the Ooze. Wikipedia, citing Adweek, says it was $50 million, which would be more than the first two movies combined. That can't be right. 
I refuse to believe they spent $50 million on this. Maybe they were planning to allocate that much money initially, but that ain't where they ended up. Well, in any case, they elected not to go with Jim Henson Studios for a third time and instead hired the All Effects Company to produce the animatronics. And clearly, they failed to live up to their predecessors. The costumes look noticeably cheaper and have dots now for some reason. You can clearly see where the mask fits over the neck, and the mouths don't really move right. And Splinter doesn't even have a bottom half anymore. And if he doesn't have a bottom half, how does he poop? These are the kinds of questions that keep me up at night. The fight scenes are also a problem, even more so than the last movie. They do at least get to use their weapons this time around, but apparently to keep things kid-friendly, they had the turtles shout random quips while they were fighting. Granted, that's not exactly new. They threw out the occasional one-liner in the first two movies, and in the cartoon, even the villains did that once in a while. Roll cameras! I've always wanted to say that. But in the third movie, that's all they do. They are constantly quipping, even when they're jumping and flipping and swinging around all over. How is that even possible? Do they not need to breathe? It gets really old after a while, and I found myself wishing the turtles would just take two seconds to shut the f*** up. For crying out loud, most of the quips aren't even funny. In fact, the comedy overall in this movie is pretty bad. There are one or two jokes that are okay. Ohio wasabi! Hello, mustard? Okay, so my Japanese is a little rusty. But most of them kind of suck. Like this moment where one of the bad guys calls Raphael an ugly lump of dung. That was an insult, Leo! Nah, you think? Not necessarily, Raph. Did you know that in some countries, dung is used as a fuel source? Oh, well, I must admit I hadn't thought of it that way. I suppose when you consider- What the hell are you talking about, Donnie? There's also this weird moment during a scene where the turtles have to rescue April, because of course they end up having to rescue April. I'll be back. Not only was there a Terminator reference for no reason, but it's so badly dubbed, I can't even tell who said it. I think it was supposed to be Raph, but it doesn't sound like Raph. It doesn't sound like any of them. If I didn't know any better, I would swear someone snuck into the studio and dubbed in that line, and they just went with it. Anyway, this time around, they at least tried to do something different in terms of the plot. Shredder and the Foot Clan are nowhere to be found, having been dispatched for good in the last movie. And apparently, this leaves the Turtles with nothing to do but dance around as easy top all day. Raph, in particular, is bored and wishes for more excitement in his life. And his wish is granted when April brings home a weird-looking scepter she found at a flea market, and somehow ends up getting teleported across space and time to feudal Japan. Hi. What do you mean, yes? And at the same time, the holder of an identical scepter in feudal Japan, a young man named Kenshin, played by Henry Hayashi, is transported to New York, 1993. And their clothes are not transported with them, but April somehow holds onto her Walkman. I'm not even going to try to explain that. Its only purpose is to lead to a lazy joke where it starts playing music and freaks everyone out so they destroy it. Never seen that one before. How did you get in April's pants? Mikey, I don't think that's any of your business. Kenshin is the son of the tyrannical Lord Noranaga, played by Seb Shimono. Tired of his father's warmongering ways, he and his girlfriend Mitsu, played by Vivian Wu, are leading a rebellion. Knowing the scepter has magical powers, Kenshin used it to wish for heroes to overthrow his father. Unfortunately, he got April, who serves little purpose in this movie except to be taken prisoner. Hell, after she gets rescued, just before the movie's climax, she basically allows herself to be imprisoned by Noranaga again. Why? I have no idea. It serves no purpose at all except to allow the turtles to rescue her again. This is April O'Neil. Get kidnapped, get rescued, rinse and repeat. This is her life now. So it's up to the turtles to go back in time and rescue April, and this means four more random feudal Japanese dudes are transported to 1993. But Splinter won't have to look after them alone as Casey Jones is back. And if you're wondering why I don't sound more excited about that, it's because he doesn't actually do anything in this movie. His job is to babysit the Japanese dudes. That's it. I remember being very happy when I saw him in one of the trailers, and then his return ended up being a complete waste. I don't even know why they bothered to bring back Elias Koteas if this was all they were going to do with the character. And Koteas can't even hide his disappointment here. He's putting forth the minimum amount of effort. Granted, this isn't the only role Koteas plays in the film. He also plays a man named Wit, implied to be a distant relative of Casey, who was imprisoned for starting a mutiny against some British douche nozzle named Walker, played by Stuart Wilson, who is trying to sell his weapons to Noronaga. 
and Walker really doesn't do much for me. I'm glad they didn't just bring back Shredder again, but Walker is kind of a generic villain. It's too bad, really, because I've seen Wilson in other movies, and I know he can be a good villain, but the script gives him so little to work with. At least he seemed to be having fun. I'm glad someone was. Anyway, the Turtles end up smack dab in the middle of the war and are mistaken by the locals for Kappa, a demon from Japanese folklore. But they endear themselves to the rebels by beating the crap out of Walker's goons and saving a kid from a burning building. And this means Raphael has a child sidekick now. Oh, that's so wonderful. Because that's just what this movie needed. Child sidekicks. Yay. After the movie meanders aimlessly for a good 20 minutes, Wit decides to switch sides because... reasons. And he kidnaps Mitsu despite the fact that she is a perfectly capable fighter and he has not demonstrated any such skill. Out of all the movies I've reviewed over the last 10 years, this may be the most egregious overuse of the damsel in distress trope. Two women get kidnapped a combined three times. What the hell? After that nonsense, the Rebels manage to defeat Nornaga, the Turtles scare off Walker's goons despite the fact that they all have guns trained on them, and Walker is taken out by Wit when he switches sides again because fuck it. And he di- Wait, what? Play that again, please. <laughs> you have got to be kidding me! I can't even call that a bad special effect. That was no special effect. He fell towards the water and then just phased out of reality. Where was the splash? I mean, I heard a splash, but I didn't see a splash. Did they forget to add the splash? Cats had better visual effects. Yeah, I said it. And then we get some unnecessary stalling as Mikey and Raph apparently don't want to go back to New York because they're idiots, but eventually they do go back and Kenshin and company return to Japan and all's right with the world. Except for the fact that this movie exists. But you know, after revisiting it many years later, I've come to realize something. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, more than any other movie in the trilogy, is the closest adaptation of the 1987 cartoon but that's not necessarily a good thing. The plot feels like something that you'd see in an episode of the show. It's a simple and ridiculous premise. There's plenty of wisecracking during the fights. The villain's henchmen are incompetent and they have to rescue April. That's the cartoon in a nutshell. The problem is an episode of the cartoon, once you take out the commercial breaks, is about 23 minutes. The movie is about an hour and a half and there's just not enough plot to fill that time as evidenced by all the stalling for bad comedy and pointless side characters. And maybe it's just me, but I felt like the Turtles' personalities got less distinct as the series went on. By the time we got to the third movie, they were all very nearly the same character. As for the acting, the cast did what they could with what they were given. Considering she was basically the perpetual damsel in distress, Paige Turco did a hell of a job, and it was nice to hear Corey Feldman as the voice of Donatello again. Coteus kinda sucked, but I don't blame him too much. He was given two characters and the script did nothing with either. Overall, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 is a pretty weak entry in the series. When I was a kid, I thought it kinda sucked. My opinion has not changed. And that's where the live-action TMNT series ended, and honestly, that's too bad. Sure, they didn't end on a high note, but there's so much more they could have done. There were plenty of characters from the comics and the cartoon that they hadn't used yet. Baxter Stockman and the Mousers, the Rat King, ooh, Stockman and Rat King together could be interesting. Krang, the Fugitoid, the Triceratons, Karai, they had plenty of options and could have made an entertaining story out of any of them. But despite the third movie still making a modest profit, they chose to end it there, and the Turtles wouldn't appear on the big screen again for well over a decade. Speaking of, I imagine some of you may ask why I did not include the 2007 animated film simply titled TMNT in this review, even though it appears to be loosely connected to the original trilogy. Well, I mainly wanted to focus on the live-action movie since they were a big part of my childhood, and I have some fond memories of them. Well, two of them. By the time TMNT came out, I was a grown-ass man, so I don't have much of a connection to it. Also, it's actually a decent movie. The animation looks great, the voice acting is solid, the action sequences are fun, the story is weird as hell, as it should be, but still coherent, and we finally got Karai on the big screen. There's not much here for me to complain about without really nitpicking. So, there you go. There's my review. TMNT. It's good. I liked it. Well, thanks for joining me for my 10th anniversary and this fun little trip down memory lane. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. And if you didn't, nothing I can do about that. 
Next time, we will return to our regularly scheduled bullshit. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. Turtle and I can't get up.